Deliverance Revival Tabernacle Church presents The Time Is Now with Pastor E.I. Osborne Jr. and friends reaching souls unlimited with the gospel of Jesus Christ raising up Jesus believers throughout New England the nation, Canada and the world and now our pastor E.I. Osborne Jr. Well, praise the name of Jesus, for he's worthy to be praised. I'm Pastor Osborne. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of The Time Is Now radio and television program. It's my prayer and sincere hope that God will use this program and use us right now as an instrument to minister to your needs. And I'm certain that God is going to do just that. We have a word that we're going to share with you today. This is maybe one of the, I, I've said this before, but this is possibly one of the most important messages you're ever going to hear. I feel like it's one of the most important things I've ever preached because it's just, just good. It's just good. So we thank God for you. We hope you're enjoying the program. To God be all the glory if you are. Go to our website, eiosborne.org. Um, you'll find times and locations of services, times when the program is on, radio program, all those things that you need. Uh, the information prayer line is there, 508-746-4085. Uh, you can correspond with us by mail at the time is now, post office box 3642, Plymouth, Massachusetts, 02361. And I tell you what, we'd love to hear from you today, okay? Um, matter of fact, we'd also love for you to come fellowship with us, all right? There's so many people that for some reason don't go to church. I might cover some of the reasons right now in this message why people don't go to church. And maybe after you hear this message, uh, this is going to help you to renew your faith and your trust in God. Okay, I meet so many people that have been through things. I know two people that I'd come to mind right away that I met over the years that I think of right now uh, who, because of a, of a loved one being murdered, not just dying, but being murdered, that that affected them in a way that they gave up their faith, their trust in God. You know, it's interesting that people don't blame the, the true, uh, 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 the person who acts, the, the devil, Satan, who is the thief, the murderer, and so on, but they blame God. But Hopefully this is going to help you to restore your faith and your trust in God. I hope you don't turn the program off now because you don't want to do that. But I hope that interests you enough to make you continue to watch. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to minister to those that you've allowed to be listening and watching right now. What an awesome God you are. And you are good all the time. Yes, you are all the time. So bless this program now. Use it for your glory. Every person listening and watching right now, do for them, Lord, the things that they're unable to do for themselves. I know that you're a God that hears and answers prayer. And I know that the prayers have been heard. And I know that the answers are on the way. So we receive them right now by faith in Jesus' name. And Lord, because of the finished work, I just see, you know what I see? I see the cross. I see the cross. I see the cross. And at the cross, I realize that the price for our sins was paid. I realize that the price for your healing was paid, was accomplished. Whatever needed to be done, whatever God needed to do so that you could be healed, whatever God needed to do so that you could be forgiven of your sins and saved and have a relationship with him, God did it 2,000 years ago. So stop waiting for God to do something that he's already done. And here's what you need to do. Just believe, believe in what God has already done. Jesus shed his blood. He already paid, paid the price for your sin. Jesus, the, uh, uh, it says, the Bible says through his stripes, the wounds on his back, he was scourged through those stripes. You're healed. You have to just believe in what God has already done for you. And as you believe and thank him for it, God's going to do it for you right now. And I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as I said, 1 Peter 5 and 8, we have an adversary. Your adversary is not a person, although a person may have done something to you and may be doing something to you, you have to realize that they're being influenced and motivated by the devil. So you're mad at a person, you can't forgive that person what they did, what they did. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I hear this person sometime talking a lot about their father. There's a preacher, they talk a lot about their father and the things that their father did to them as a child. And as much, as much as I know they've forgiven him and they talk about it because they affected him, it affected them. And they're saying it from a position of trying to help other people because there are other people who are going through, not just have been through, but maybe even going through those same types of things 
while they're saying these things, it's helping them and blessing them and so on. But you have to realize what one of the things is what makes it easier to forgive the person is to recognize that they were being influenced by the enemy. You say, well, they still did it. Well, some people didn't really, don't really have the control or the strength that you might think to overcome the adversary. But the point is, Satan is our adversary. So 1 Peter 5 and 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil doesn't have the authority. Satan doesn't have the authority to just devour anyone at his will and his desire. Uh, and so he's seeking someone to devour. And here's what I would tell you, don't be that one. You know, the Bible first here says, be sober, be vigilant. The people most likely to be devoured by, the, by Satan, our adversary, are those who are not sober and vigilant. Vigilant is on guard watching. Sober is not in your right mind under the influence, you know, not just under the influence of drugs, alcohol or whatever, but also anger, unforgiveness. You know, you don't make a decision about something when you're angry because it's, it's influenced uh, uh, by the anger. It's going to be wrong. Don't make a decision or choice or say something to someone when you're, when you're in unforgiveness. You're going to say the wrong thing, right? And so you're going to make a wrong choice. So you need to be sober. If you're not, you could be devoured, all right? But just to make the point that your adversary is the devil, not a person. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 tells us, we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and so on. So your adversary in this warfare, it's spiritual. And although, yes, the devil may be using people, you have to deal with that from the source. The source of it is Satan, the devil, all right, and so on. So use your authority and, 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 and deal with it from that point of view. I'm just trying to get through this. So now... Um, even, well, so, I mean, oh, let me read something to you. So in Genesis chapter 3, one of the things that happens is one of the ways that Satan deceives us and defeats us is through deception, okay? The Bible tells us that the woman, Eve, was deceived. When Adam sinned, he did it willfully, uh, knowingly. He knew exactly what he was doing, disobeying God, whereas Eve, she was deceived. So in Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he causes her to question, Is this what God really said? Is that what he really meant? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit that is in the, uh, uh, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she quotes to him. She knows what God said, Genesis 2. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She knows that. Satan introduces this deception, confusion, questioning God and his word. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. He first questions, he causes Eve to question and wonder and doubt God and his word. He says, you won't die. He's saying God lied to you about that. You're not going to die. And then he gives Eve a different reason. He says, see, it's not that you're going to die. God didn't tell you not to do that just because you're going to die. Here's why he told you that. He introduces a different reason different motive by God, and so on. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But one of the things we know men desire is power, okay? And to be better than other, someone else, and so on. So he says God's real reason for not wanting you to eat is that your eyes are going to be open, all right? And you'll, you'll, uh, uh, your eyes shall be open, uh, 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 you'll be as gods. You're going to be like God, as God, which is what Satan wanted, and you're going to know good and evil. Now, to me, the good and evil is where he got her. Because at that point, what Eve recognizes is this. I know good, but what's evil? Because everything that God created, Genesis chapter 1, he looks, he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. She doesn't know what evil is. So now it's like, hmm, evil. So he kind of gets her. So here's what happens, though. The Eve knows don't eat of the fruit. God says don't eat it, don't even touch it. Now when it says touch it, I believe you could include any of the five senses. Don't touch it, don't look at it, don't go over and sniff it and smell it. Don't put your finger on, mm, let me see, mm, mm, ooh, you know, don't, don't do that, okay? Don't take, don't even get a little taste of it to see, ooh, that's good. You know, no, don't do that, don't do any of that. I think when God said don't touch it, don't eat it, don't even touch it, don't look at it, don't taste it, don't smell it, 
Don't feel it. Ooh, ooh. You know, no, don't do any of that lest you die. Because that's what's going to produce the desire. Looking, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. That's what's going to create the lust, the desire for it in your heart. And I think when God told them that, I think if, the, if, the, if that tree was over there, they walk by looking over here. I believe if it's over there, they're walking by as far away from it. Listen, if I said to you, don't touch that or you could die, and you believe me, you're going to make sure you stay f as far away from that as possible. You're going to make sure you don't even want to look at it. You're not going to be curious. Let me just go. You're going to, if you believe that it could kill you, see, but what, what happened is when Satan introduced a different perspective, it, when he introduced that word, it changed Eve's perspective about that tree altogether. She went from not even looking, trying to avoid it, to being curious about it, to going by, hmm, wait a minute, hmm, that's a beautiful fruit. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Look at it. It's beautiful. You know, hmm, and, and I, 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 I can smell it. Ooh, that smells so good. You see, and all of a sudden it becomes seductive because she's in range now to smell the fruit. She sees it a little better, how beautiful it really is, you know, and she might even got curious to say, let me see, it looks so smooth. It's, ooh, see, and all those things. Next thing you know, she's eating. But all of that happened out of deception and Satan introducing a different perspective. You're not going to die. It's going to make you wise. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, verse 6, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took uh, uh, of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband and he did eat. What happened? Her perspective changed. Satan introduced a word, some, 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 uh, 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 deception and her perspective of what God said not to do change. It's the same thing that happens. You watch stuff on television, read things in a book, see a movie, and next thing you know, something that your mom, your dad, you knew this evil, you read in the Bible is bad, you say, ooh, I want to try that. You know, something you knew you didn't want to do and all like that, you know, and so on. And you say, ooh, I heard that and I read that and I saw that. And all of a sudden your perspective changes, even though the Bible says something. So the point I'm trying to make is, okay, that that, that, that when, when Eve saw these things, all right, her perspective of those things changed and so on. So now, oh man, I got so many things I need to say, all right? But he, in introducing uh, 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 this, this, this different perspective, it created doubt. God said you're going to die. Satan introduces something, it creates doubt. It creates unbelief. It creates wavering. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He did that in Genesis chapter 3. He's still doing it today. Why? Because he is the thief. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they may have it more abundantly. Why did Satan introduce this alternative word, this alternative idea to what God said? To, so that Eve could hear it, be deceived, change her perspective, begin to doubt and waver. Is that word that God said, is what God said really true? Is what God told me really true? Is what God said really true? So he, he just simply introduced a different word perspective to create this doubt, wavering, unbelief. Is what God said really true? Why did he do that? Because without doing that, he can't steal, kill, and destroy. First, in, in John 10, 10, it says, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, here's the reason. It's not in that order, I don't believe, simply because, you know, it just works better when you read it. Steal, kill, destroy. I believe it's in that order because Satan can't steal, kill, and destroy until he first steals. He can't kill you until he first steals from you. He can't destroy you until he first steals from you. But what, is it he has to, what is it that he has to steal from you before he can kill you or destroy you? It is your faith. It is, listen, it is your believing, faith believing, it is your believing God. It is your faith and trust in God. Up until the point that Eve, uh, Eve knew God said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat it, you're going to die. He said, don't even look at it. Don't touch it lest you die. As long as Eve totally believed God, she's all set. And so is Adam. The moment some other concept, idea, word is introduced, all of a sudden now, she's wavering, she's in unbelief, she's in doubt. 
she has lost her faith and her trust in God because not only that, God told her something. Satan says, that's not what it is. God knows you're going to be as God. You're going to know good and evil. And now all of a sudden she believes God is holding something back. God, God has lied to me. God has deceived me. And I don't, I don't know if I can trust God anymore because I thought he said I'm going to die. Satan said I won't die. He said it's because God doesn't want me to have these things. So he has created this different perspective that's, that's caused her to lose her faith in God her belief in God's word, her faith in God, her trust in God, and now what? She eats, and now he, Satan has accomplished. But how did he do it? First, he had to steal. He had to steal her faith in God's word. He had to steal her faith. Once he stole her faith in God's word, got everything else he wanted. He's got to steal. So here's the thing. So what does the devil want? He wants your faith, okay? So now, the thief comes to steal. The thief wants your faith. Because without faith, Hebrews 11 and 6, it's impossible to please God. You can't please God without faith, okay? Without faith, you can't be saved. For, for by grace are you saved, and that by faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So without faith, you can't even be saved. So you're going to spend eternity in hell because you have no faith. So what is, what is the thing that the thief wants? What does the devil want? He wants your faith. Okay, and one of the things he does, and I'm cutting this so short, I'm cutting this so short because I have to try to fit everything in, but I'm going to go to Isaiah 54. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to Isaiah 54. And listen, I'll go to, first I'm going to go to John chapter 6. And it's interesting that this verse, I think I'm going to fit it in, is John chapter 6 and verse 66. Isn't that something? So in John chapter 6, and verse 66, I'm going to read a couple of verses ahead of that. You know what happened? Jesus here in John 6 is introducing what we call the communion. Now, at that time, they didn't know communion. They didn't know what communion was all about. He hadn't even done the Lord's Supper yet and all that, okay, uh, uh, and so on. So he says to them, verily I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. What? They didn't understand that. They're thinking, you know, this is some kind of, what kind of occult madness is this dude talking about? Eating his flesh and drinking his blood? They knew the, they knew the dietary laws God had given them. You don't eat the, 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 the flesh with the blood. Don't eat the flesh with the blood because the life is in the blood. They understood that, all right? And now here comes Jesus talking about you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're thinking, what kind of occult madness is this dude into, all right? But see, but th here's why, because they didn't understand. So Jesus says to them, he says to them uh, in verse 60, 61, he says, does this offend you? All right. When Jesus knew in himself that he murmured, he said, does this offend you? Yeah, they were offended. Offense deals with cause to sin. It deals with putting a stumbling block in someone's way. And so, yeah, when he talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, yeah, yeah, it offended them. Okay. To the point where it says some of them stopped walking with him. Okay, it says here, um, verse 60, many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this thing, this, this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And then it tells us that many of them stopped following Jesus. In verse 66, John 6 and verse 66 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because they were offended. Why were they offended? Jesus did something that they did not understand. You know what happens today? Things happen in people's lives that they say God did. Maybe God did it. God allowed it. And you know what? They don't understand it, and so they do the same thing. They stop walking with God. They walk with him no more. Why? Because they are offended. They don't understand. It happened then. It happened now. And unless you know the truth, and unless you know Unless you know that how much God, see what's going to overcome that, unless you know how much God really, really loves you, God loves you too much to do something to hurt you. God loves you too much to do something to hurt you. Now, God may allow some things in your life and he may do some things in your life. Listen, listen to me. God may do some things in your life and God may allow some things in your life that hurt you. He may do some things that hurt you, and he may allow some things that hurt you, but he didn't do it to hurt you. He didn't allow it to hurt you. He did it, he allowed it, and it hurt you, but he didn't do it to hurt you. 
Little baby's laying on the floor, picks up a marble, starts to put it in his mouth. You take it. Now, you can say, no, 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 right? Take that marble, you put it away. You could say, because baby, you're going to choke on it. It's going to hurt you. If it gets in your little tummy, we're going to have to take it to the hospital. They're going to pump your stomach. They're going to have to do surgery. And, the, and the, that baby looks at you, doesn't understand what you're talking about. All that baby knows is, I want that marble. I want to put it in my mouth. Doesn't understand why you took it. So you took that marble. It hurt that baby. That baby's on the floor screaming, ah, screaming. It hurt him. It hurt her. But you didn't do it to hurt her. You didn't do it to hurt him. You see what I mean? Same thing with God. God can take some things from you, allow some things, do some things, whatever. It hurts you, but he didn't do it to hurt you. You see what I'm saying? That's what I do. And listen, even if he explains it to you, like that little two-year-old baby, oh, baby, I don't want you to choke. You could choke on this, and it could, you could die. That baby screaming just as much, don't care, mad at you, looking at you cross-eyed. You're thinking if I was big enough, see, but you're not. So, but, but listen, so even if God, listen, you, God's infinite, we're finite, even if God tried to explain it to you, you may not get it, just like the baby. So here's what I'll close with. So recognize, there's going to be some stuff that happens that you don't understand. So I got to close with this. I got about two, three minutes almost. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. Now, Isaiah 54, 17 says this, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Okay. Right away I read the verse, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Sunday when I read that, the Lord dropped into my spirit. There are people here that are thinking, I certainly had some weapons that the enemy formed, and they prospered in my life. And there's somebody someone, someone's people watching right now, you've heard this verse before, and even as I say it, your, your thought is, the weapons have prospered in my life. The word prosper means succeed. No weapon formed against you shall succeed. No weapon formed against you will work. It won't work. And you're thinking, well, it sure worked in my life. It sure succeeded, okay, in my life, all right? Now, God never said that your adversary, the devil, won't form weapons. He never said, I'm going to stop him from forming weapons. He's going to let him form all the weapons. But what, he, but what he promised is they won't succeed, they won't work, they won't prosper. And you're thinking, well, it sure prospered. And here's why you think it prospered. You think the weapon prospered because your house was repossessed, your foreclosed. Your car was repossessed. You think the weapon prospered because you were diagnosed with cancer. You think the weapon prospered because a family member, a loved one, a friend, or someone, young, baby, child, whatever, died. And you're thinking that weapon sure prospered in my life. That's what you're thinking. See? But here's what you don't realize. The reason the weapon did not succeed is because that's not the weapon, not what the weapon was formed for. You might have been diagnosed with cancer. And you might say, the weapon stole my health, but that's, it didn't, so you think it succeeded. But listen, it did not succeed because you have cancer. It did not prosper or succeed because somebody died, because that's not the reason it was formed. Here's what I want to tell you. The cancer, the child dying, the person dying, you got laid off from your job, you got fired, your business went bankrupt. That is the weapon. That was the weapon. That was the weapon. That was, that's not what the weapon was trying to accomplish. That was the weapon. That was the weapon. And what the weapon was formed to do is steal your faith. The weapon that Satan formed, the purpose of it was to get your faith. That's why he formed the weapon. He did not form the weapon to steal, take your health. He did not form the weapon to kill your child. He did not form the weapon to, 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 for your bankrupt business to go bank. He didn't, you die, you're going to heaven. Somebody dies, they're going to heaven. You're going to see them again. He, he didn't gain anything from that. You lose your house. He don't need a house. He can't drive, doesn't need a car, and he's not in competition with your business, okay? He's like, well, they're selling more lemonade than me. I gotta, he, he, he could care less about your business. He formed a weapon for the purpose of stealing your faith. And as long as he doesn't get your faith, the weapon does not prosper. Because all the weapons he's forming, he could kill everybody you, you know. And as long as he doesn't get your faith, that weapon didn't prosper. Because he didn't form it to kill somebody. That's the weapon. He didn't form it to get your business. That's the weapon. He didn't form it, okay, to, 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 to get your, steal your house. 
He formed the weapon to get your faith. And as long as he doesn't get your faith, it won't prosper. And God says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that's right. So tongues are rising up. Why? To get your faith. But he says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. All right? And it won't because God's desire is that in everything we can give him thanks. In everything give thanks. Not because it's God's will, but God's will is that in everything we give him thanks. God's will is that no matter what happens, we give him thanks. The best picture of that is Job. Job lost everything. In a moment of time, everything, wealthiest man in the East, everything's gone. Ten children dead in one day. Not over a period of time, one day, moment of time, ten children dead, everything gone. Job, everything gone. Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. After Job lost all that, he rent his clothes and worshipped. Job, the weapon Satan formed against Job, Satan formed some weapons, the Chaldeans, the this, the that, all right, all the people that came against Job killed all of his servants, his children, took all of his stuff and all like that. They were the weapon. What was Satan trying to steal? The kids were the, no, his faith. I'll get, Job will curse you to your face. Uh, he'll turn his back on you, lose his faith in you, lose his trust in you, and he'll curse you to his faith. He will, face, he will stop having faith in you. But after Satan formed all those weapons that each servant came in, the Chaldeans, the this, the that, fire from heaven came down, destroyed, all your children are gone, all those weapons did not accomplish, did not prosper in the thing that Satan was trying to accomplish, which was what? Steal Job's faith. If you don't know Jesus, Say this with me right now. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Come into my heart. Live in me. Fill me with your spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Got to go. We love you. want to remind you, Jesus Christ came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. So stop dying and live, live, live. Thank you for tuning in to The Time Is Now with Pastor E.I. Osborne, Jr. and friends. We pray that this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like some information on anything you heard in today's episode or to find out how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, please call us at 508-746-4085. If you would like a copy of this message, further information about our ministry, or to make a donation, please visit our website at www.eiosborne.org or correspond by mail at the time is now p.o box 3642 plymouth massachusetts 02361 on behalf of the ministry thank you